तव कथामृत तप्त जीवन कविबीरीडित कलमशापह श्रवणमंगल श्रीमदात भुवि गृणंती भुरीदा जना we are beginning a new chapter sri ram krishna with devotees <coughs> at the shampukur house shampukur is a place in kolkata where sri ram krishna was shifted from dakshineshwar when his throat cancer became quite serious and the devotees felt that they should be shifting him to a place nearer the doctor's house dr sarkar who was staying very near and the other doctors who were treating him there were quite a few doctors who were treating him and also because it was easy for the disciples some of them were of course staying were trying to stay full time in the shampukur house which was rented for this purpose the rest of them used to come and it would be easy for them to come to shampukur rather than go to dakshineshwar so he had just shifted and of course after a few months they found the place is not very suitable <clears throat> it was rather damp and uh, very cold and it was not very suitable for his health so they shifted him to a bigger place where he spent the last few months of his life six months of his life that is kashipur garden house so kashi before shifting to kashipur he was in shampukur for some few days few weeks <clears throat> and the incident which we are going to discuss now took place there <clears throat> next day <clears throat> is monday 26th october 1885 the 11th of kartik the third day of the dark fortnight of ashwin sri ram krishna is staying in the same house at kashampukur in calcutta for treatment dr sarkar his physician visits him almost every day though devotees go to him regularly to report thakur's condition it is the autumn season The Sharadiya Durga Puja was celebrated a few days ago. Sri Ramakrishna's devotees observed it with mixed joy and sadness. For their Guru Deva has been suffering seriously for the last 3 months with cancer of the throat. Hearing that it is incurable, the unfortunate devotees shed tears in solitude. <clears throat> This is the explanation which M is giving. M, who is the chronicler of the gospel, is trying to explain the situation <coughs> after Sri Ram Krishna was sh- shifted to Shampukur. They all knew that his end is very near because cancer was considered to be an incurable disease in those days. So they are all shedding tears in solitude. <coughs> some of them are living at the shampukur house in order to nurse sri ram krishna which they are doing with their hearts and souls most of them were the would be monastic disciples and the biographer of sri ram krishna swami shardanand ji in the great master says the shampukur and kashipur days were the period of sri ram krishna's life in which he was to consolidate and make a clear distinction between the householder disciples and the monastic disciples the would be monastic disciples who were young boys he gathered around him and most of them left their homes and came and stayed with him some of them had some pending issues and they had to sort it out before coming and staying there but latu and uh, tarak and some other disciples who were comparatively free 
as compared to the other uh, monastic disciples, would be monastic disciples, they came in, they normally used to stay with Holy Mother Sri Sharda Devi. Now, <clears throat> M is observing, some of them are living at Shampukur house in order to nurse Sri Ramakrishna, which they were doing with their hearts and souls. Through such service, Narendra and other unmarried young disciples, filled with dispassion, are learning to climb the steps of renunciation of lust and greed. Despite Sri Ramakrishna's severe pain, crowds still come for his darshan. They feel peace and joy when they see him. He is an ocean of motiveless grace, and there is no end to his compassion. He talks to them all anxious about their welfare. Finally, the doctors, particularly Dr. Sarkar, tell him not to speak at all because that was irritating his throat. But the doctor himself, who stays there for six or seven hours at a time, says, you should not talk to anybody else, but you can talk to me. He was a very strange kind of person, though he was an atheist by his own admission. He was an atheist and he was he did a lot to promote science. In fact, he was the one who started the Indian Association for Cultivation of Sciences at Jadopur, which is still there. And uh, Sri Ramakrishna, in fact, visited his institute at his request. <clears throat> and later on, Swami Vivekananda, Sister Nivedita and other disciples of other disciples also visited that place very often. And this, uh, the dawn of the science movement in India, you can attribute to Dr. Sarkar because it was this institute which produced the first Nobel Prize India has won <coughs> in the field of science working in this particular institute in Jadavpur. Indian IACS as it was known. The institute which was started by Mahindralal Sarkar was to promote the scientific spirit among the younger generation and his son Amrutlal Sarkar whose reference who will be referred to now was also instrumental in carrying on that act, those activities very successfully even after the passing away of Dr. Sarkar, Dr. Mahindra Lal Sarkar. Mahindra Lal Sarkar was of course a doctor, an MD from Calcutta University, Calcutta Medical College. But he was attracted by homeopathy. It is very strange that he took to homeopathy in a, under very strange circumstances. As a president, as a student, or maybe as a uh, doctor who belonged to allopathy and who did his MD, he was very keen to show, or maybe he was motivated by the members of his fraternity to show that the homeopathic system of medicine is nothing but uh, a superstition. And that is why he decided to study homeopathy, to evaluate its comparative merits and demerits and show to the world that homeopathy is not effective, nor is it based on scientific principles. But when he started studying it in depth, he somehow got attracted to that system of medicine and he became, he himself got converted to the science of homeopathy and he became a great supporter or a great proponent himself of homeopathy. So he was trying out uh, homeopathic medicine on Sri Ramakrishna and he used to come and very often he used to come giving up his regular patients. He was a very popular doctor and he used to give up, uh, give a lot of time to Sri Ramakrishna not just because he wanted to treat him, but he was very keen that he should, he simply loved to be in the company of Sri Ramakrishna. It was something 
which could not be explained because he was not a man of religion, definitely. And being an atheist, he would not be seen in such gatherings. So it was rather strange that he could he managed to spend, and towards the later part, later later part of Sri Ramakrishna's life, especially during the Shampukur and the Kashipur days, he spent a lot of time. Somehow, some strange spiritual qualities, which he was not able to understand, attracted him, and that made him spend a lot of time with Sri Ramakrishna. So, he is telling other people, <clears throat> because as a doctor he has to advise that Sri Ramakrishna should not be speaking too much. That was irritating his throat, which was already uh, very bad, in very bad condition. But he is simply enchanted and he was he is wonderstruck by the nectar of Sri Ramakrishna's word, the joy on his face and his lack of utter lack of body consciousness which is a hallmark of spiritual life. Many times he was astounded to believe that such a phenomena could take place. Under such trying circumstances, under such pain, that a person can be so joyful and not be concerned about his own condi condition of his own body, that was giving him, I mean, uh, his scientific knowledge somehow wanted to get convinced and to know what kind of phenomena he, uh, he is demonstrating. And very often when he went into ecstasy and samadhi, about which we will be hearing now, he used to want, he was wonderstruck because the physiological changes that took place in uh, Sri Ramakrishna were not according to what medical science told him. They found, he found he examined all the parameters and found that the signs of a totally inert or a dead human being were exhibited when he went into Nirvikalpa Samadhi and he could not detect the breath, he could not detect any sign of prana in his body, life force in his body, except perhaps a little heat on the top of the head which one of the Ayurvedic doctors used to point out just to confirm whether Sri Ramakrishna is in Samadhi or he has left the body. If you remember, uh, the Ayurvedic doctor used to touch the top of the head and feel if there was some heat left, that means the Udana Vayu has not left the body. So a little bit of prana which keeps a person alive would be there. But this was not observed in normal human beings. So, maybe out of curiosity, Mahindralal Sarkar was really surprised to see this strange phenomena when Sri Ramakrishna went into ecstasy, uh, utterly forgetting that he had a body which, is, which was full of pain. So, after seeing all these things, he is attracted and not only that, he loved the very nature, the pure and the uh, uncomplicated nature, childlike nature of Sri Ramakrishna and his holy holiness perhaps was another factor which attracted him, irrespective of his religious uh, beliefs. He was not a man of religion, he believed science or the scientific approach to life was the only approach that was desirable. So this is a very interesting incident now. In the sense, uh, the discussions which take place towards the end of his life is where you will find Mahindralal Sarkar often present because M used to sometimes visit him and bring him to Sri Ramakrishna or he used to travel with uh, M in his carriage. So, M will go to the doctor at 10 o'clock to report Sri Ramakrishna's condition. He speaks to Sri Ramakrishna before going. Now, right now, he is with Sri Ramakrishna, he has to go and report and maybe at a later time, at a, uh, a later hour, he would be coming to see him whenever he is free after he has seen all the patients. So Ramakrishna is telling him, I have much less pain. Uh, Sri Ramakrishna is telling him, 
I have much less pain. I feel much better. Is it because of the medicine? Should I take that medicine? Now with all the... Uh, Sri Ramakrishna was so childlike and so naturally simple or uncomplicated that he believed in whatever medicines the doctors gave him. The homeopathic doctors gave him certain things, the allopathic doctors, the Vaidyas, they also used to come and treat him. And he was fine. He didn't mind taking anything. Though he knew it's the will of mother that will either save him, save his body from disintegrating. <coughs> So he's asking him in a very childlike manner, should I take this medicine? I feel much better today. Sri Ramakrishna says, M says, I'm going to the doctor, I'll tell him everything. He will prescribe what is best for you. Then Sri Ramakrishna says, you know Purna, he hasn't been here for two or three days. I am worried. So Purna Chandra Ghosh was one of the Ishwar Kotis, who was a householder disciple, no doubt. But Sri Ramakrishna considered him to be a spiritual person of the highest uh, level. He classified them with the four or five Ishwar Kotis, of course, including Narendra. There was Swami Brahmananda, there was Swami Yogananda, there was Swami Premananda and Swami Niranjananda. So these were the four other than Swami Vivekananda whom Sri Ramakrishna called his Antaranga or the inner circle of monastic disciples who were Nitya Mukta, who were ever free and who came to uh, participate in the Leela of Sri Ramakrishna along with him. They were not bound but they had to perform the Leela. So in the process there were some other disciples who were of a high spiritual caliber, though they did not become monastics. One of them was Purnachandra Ghosh. He came when he was very young and seeing his spiritual potential, as you all know, Sri Ramakrishna used to see the samskara, see the entire spiritual possibilities inherent in every devotee who came to him, as if he saw things in things placed inside a glass cupboard. In his own language, if we see, he used to say, I can see the nature of people. I can see their samskaras. I can see their nature, spiritual nature. And just them, ju just as a person sees things inside the cupboard. So whenever such people came, whenever the Ishwar Kotis came, he used to identify them and then give them necessary teachings so that they could carry out his divine, he could carry out his divine Leela, leela through, uh, through them. So this was what, uh, he is also referring to one Urna Chandra Ghosh, who was a young boy at that time and he is upset that he has not been able to come. There was a lot of pressure from his parents who were not very happy that he was regularly visiting Sri Ramakrishna. They wanted him to focus on his career and his uh, the worldly life which he was to lead. And they literally forced him against his wishes to marry also. So this Purna could not come very often. And Sri Ramakrishna used to find it very difficult when he could not come. For some reason, he knew that there will be some obstruction from his family. So, now and then you will find Sri Ramakrishna becoming restless for a few people like Narendra Nath, Purna Chandra, because he knew of their spiritual potential and he wanted that they should be coming often. But somehow circumstances prevented them from coming. In fact, Purna Chandra, one such conversation was recorded <coughs> where Sri Ramakrishna says, uh, M has recorded, Sri Ramakrishna says, why has Purna not come? He is feeling so concerned for him. He is feeling so concerned and he says, uh, if he doesn't come, how will he realize God? I mean, how will he express his spiritual potential? So when he saw that he was so much concerned uh, and those things were recorded and Purna Chandra Ghosh after, his, after many many years after this passing away of Sri Ramakrishna, he felt a desire to commit suicide because 
circumstances were very bad in his family so naturally he was contemplating that he should commit suicide but then he decided one last time i'll just read this gospel before i take this step and he went to the shrine prayed to sri ram krishna and was tried to read the gospel he opened a page where the conversation was to this effect that sri ram krishna is worried that purna is not able to come and he was worried that he had not uh, is not able to make spiritual progress so when he read that there was a great change in purna's heart purna chandra ghosh's heart he believed here is a person because he was disillusioned by his own family and all the relatives the relatives he had so there was some burning issue in his life in his worldly life but here he got immediate comfort when he read that it was only a few years ago that sri ram krishna is being so restless so that i uh, make spiritual progress he is worrying so much for me and if i could not go there sometimes he used to go and visit wait outside purna's house and ask him to come outside and meet him feed him with some sweets or prasad or something like that so seeing uh, that sri ram krishna loved him so tenderly and was so much concerned about his spiritual progress that thought or by reading that portion from the gospel purna chandra ghosh was overwhelmed and then he decided not to commit suicide which he was contemplating seriously so that is this uh, uh, purna chandra ghosh about whom sri ram krishna is asking him you know purna he hasn't been here for two or three days i am worried because he was worried that his relatives especially his parents and the other relatives were capable of doing anything to him to prevent him from uh, taking up spirituality and st- hindering his spiritual progress so kali <clears throat> him then the kali or kali was a uh, swami who later on became swami abedanand who spent a lot of time in america so he is telling kali why don't you go and ask purna to come perhaps he was not staying very far from shampukur all the most of the disciples householder as well as the would be monastic disciples were staying in kolkata so he tells kali who was there staying in shampukur house trying to serve sri ram krishna so he asks him why don't you go and call him kali says i'll leave immediately then sri ram krishna also tells him the doctor son is a very good boy please ask him to come now this is amrit lal sarkar who was the son of uh mahendra lal sarkar who started the indian association for cultivation of sciences this was an institute where the great nobel prize winner c v raman and then jagdish chandra and the others other scientists very prominent scientists of calcutta in those days c v raman and all uh, jagdish chandra bose and many others boshi sen so there were quite a few who were associated with this iacs indian association for cultivation of sciences so amrit lal sarkar in after the passing away of mahendra lal sarkar uh, very carefully and nicely nurtures this institute because in those days unlike the indian institute of science which was later started in 1910 uh, this institute did not receive government patronage especially the british government was not keen and nor was uh, dr mahendra lal sarkar keen to take british help because he wanted this institute to be to be run by indians it was to be for indians by and run by indian people only he did not want any interference from the uh, british government whereas in the indian institute of science the in the initial stages till cv raman became its first director indian director it was run under the leadership of some british scientist some accomplished scientist from england so which uh, mahendra lal sarkar refused so the government not only uh, 
did not give him patronage. He found it very difficult in the initial stages to run the institute financially because many of the kings and the small kings or the soft small princes who had offered him help, rich people, zamindars, had offered him help for the institute to promote science. They backed, they backed out because they felt the British government would be upset if they helped him. So he had, he died a very, uh, Dr. Sarkar died a very sad man because his pet project could not take off as Indian Institute of Science uh, took off later on in 1910. That was much later, of course, uh, when Sarkar, Dr. Sarkar was no more. But he was sad that his pet project was not getting the kind of response from Indian, rich Indians as uh, the other project, the Indian Institute of, Indian Institute of Science, of course, uh, was under consideration even when Dr. Sarkar was alive and uh, Tata also sent uh, some of the people, some of the people who were to later develop that institute, including Sister Nevidita to Dr. Sarkar for consultation, but he would not budge. He said, under no circumstances, I will agree to that uh, clause, which well, later on the Indian Institute of Science had to un uh, agree to, that is, allow the British to head that institution till it could get a uh, qualified director from among, among, among Indians. So that's why C.V. Raman and all, they first studied in IACS, Later on, when they got an opportunity, they went to Indian Institute of Science and in fact, C.V. Raman became its first director. So, M. Sri Ramakrishna was very fond of Amrut Sarkar, who was a young boy, of course, in those days. Maybe he was a young man. And he says, he's a good boy, you please call him. So, Kali has been interested in the job of going and calling both Purna and Kali. Reaching the doctor's house, M finds him sitting with two or three friends. So M has not, uh, M has just gone to give the report of Sri Ramakrishna's health condition to Mahindralal Sarkar, who is yet to leave for, uh, after, after he gets the report, he will prepare the medicines and bring it and then spend quite a few hours in the company of Sri Ramakrishna. That was his normal routine. So, uh, reaching the doctor's house, M finds him sitting with two or three friends. The doctor asks M, I was talking about you just a minute ago. You said you would come at 10 o'clock. I have been waiting here for an hour and a half. I was wondering what happened and how he was doing, how Sri Ramakrishna was doing. Because normally he would wait for M to come and give the report and then he would take some decision. Either go there or send the medicines with him to a friend. So the other two friends who were there, he loved singing. So he asked them to sing. And the song that was being sung, the friend sings, Sing as long as you live the name and glories of him whose splendor illumines the universe. This is perhaps a Brahmo song. So they believe in glorifying nature. And they believe that God is one who controls this nature and who gives beauty, power and all these things which we, the great things, grand things that we see in nature is a result, is nothing but a manifestation of God. And they worship that aspect of God. So, perhaps this is a Brahmo song. I am not sure which is the original Bengali song. But sing as long as you live the name and glories of him whose splendor illumines the universe, whose boundless love streams like nectar, bringing joy to all. The thought of his compassion brings a thrill, the hair stands on end. What words can express him, whose grace instantly ends all sorrows? This is one common aspect of Godhood in all the religious traditions of the world whether they believe as God, uh, believe God as mother or God as father or God as a ruler or God as an immanent as existence pervading the entire universe, a formless 
existence, a formless consciousness, which doesn't have form, but at the same time, uh, he assumes certain forms, uh, certain qualities. He has, he has qualities, though he doesn't have a form. And some of the qualities are compassion and uh, love or light and all those things. So they describe the formless God in various ways, though they don't attribute a form to him. So he says, these are the songs which say, what words cannot express him, because he is the inexpressible, just as Upanishads, which have all different types of conceptions of God possible, uh, that they are discussed in the Upanishads. So also, uh, the Brahmo songs, which have been heavily, they have borrowed ideas from the Upanishads, and they have taken from other uh, world religions and other world traditions. Some of the great uh, qualities or the great uh, qualities which were used, which are being used, which were being used to express the glory of God in different religions. So those were taken and these beautiful songs were composed. So Brahmo, according to the Brahmo uh, philosophy or the Brahmo movement, <coughs> the it is not possible to, but one thing, one common quality of God, God in whichever form he comes as a human being, as an avatar, uh, as a dualist, as a non-dualist or uh, as a Hindu, Muslim or Christian, one common thing which we can attribute to God, which can ascribe to God is that he is the remover of sorrows. Because the very existence of religion presupposes that we find this life full of sorrow. We find this life or this samsara as it is known. The jagat or the world, the samsara that we live in is not always full of joy. It is at the best a mixture of joy and sorrow. So if such is the case, then uh, the idea of God was mooted or idea of God was formed in the minds of all the people who were on the quest to discover the spiritual truths and they wanted the God whom they worship, the God whom they believe in to remove all their sorrows. So whose grace instantly ends sorrows and he has the capacity which no human being has to remove the sorrows. When we try in the world to remove our sorrows using temporary means, using people, and we find that we very often do not succeed to a very small extent or do not succeed at all. Our efforts become futile. But when we uh, approach God and somehow we find miraculously our prayers are answered as depending on the faith of the votary. The votaries of God whether they believe in a formless God or a God with form, whether they believe in any uh, religion, the firm votaries, the people who are very much devoted, they somehow find or they somehow get convinced that all their prayers are definitely answered. How they are answered, the philosophies vary. Some say God answers the prayers from within the heart. Some people say that he is sitting above in the clouds and in some mysterious way comes to your help. But whatever be the conception which different religions or different sects believe in, they, they, they certainly believe that worship of God is meant to remove our sorrows. So this is the line which says what words can express him. Perhaps I may not be able to express him. That's what the poet is singing here. I can't express him. I can't express fully his qualities, but I know his grace can instantly end all my sorrows. On every side, above, below, in water and sky, where is his limit? Where is his end? This is the infinitude of God, the infinitude of Sat Chit Ananda, eternal existence, eternal consciousness, eternal bliss, never ending bliss. We don't want a mixture of joy and sorrow as we see in the world. So, going beyond the world is something which every religion accepts. How to go beyond? What is the nature of the world? What is the nature of Prakriti? About this, there may be disputes. There may be difference of opinion. 
But one thing is sure that nothing permanent or permanently joyful or permanently blissful or permanently, uh, uh, nothing permanent can be found in this impermanent or temporary world. This is one concept which is clear to all the prophets and they are part of the, their teachings uh, and the philosophy. They believe that there cannot, if you want to remove sorrow or if you want to remove all the troubles on a permanent basis, permanently, then we have to hold on to God who is eternal, who is uh, eternally graceful and compassionate and can uh, remove all our sorrows forever. Not, not piecemeal uh, as we find uh, human efforts or when we approach human beings, when we try for worldly solutions to our problems, we find that at the most they are a kind of patchwork. You cannot solve all our problems, we cannot solve all our problems permanently. So here he says that uh, here the poet seems to be saying that he is infinite and the infinite is his grace or capacity to remove all sorrow. On every side, above, below, in water, in sky, where is his limit? Where is his end? His seekers forever ask. He is the abode of consciousness, the great transformer, stainless and pure, the ever wakeful eye, whose vision leaves not a trace of sorrow. So, this is what uh, this, this song is trying to express. And though uh, Mahindralal Sarkar was uh, by belief was an atheist, but he loved to hear these songs about the formless God. Perhaps his objection, he had some kind of inclination to believe in the Brahmo philosophy, which did not uh, require of anybody to accept an incarnation or a personal God. They believed in the infinite power of nature, whose the nature or prakriti which is expressing itself as this world. So they considered that to be real and a mysterious natural force which is formless will somehow solve the problems of life was what they believed in. So that is their conception of what spirituality or religion is. Anyway, so he is the abode of consciousness, the great transformer, stainless and pure, the ever wakeful I, because uh, we cannot, uh, say, as Sri Ramakrishna said, we asked once Latu Maharaj, who was a very simple, illiterate disciple of his. He hardly uh, knew how, how to read and write. So he asked, because his ishta was Rama. So one day, suddenly, he called Latu Maharaj, Swami Adbhutananda, and asked him, uh, what is your Rama doing now? So, is he awake? What is he doing? So, this was a new uh, sort of question which Latu Maharaj had, was surprised to uh, and he did not know the answer. How can I know what my Lord is doing right now? Of course, then he uh, yeah. told certain things. But then, uh, he clearly uh, said uh, that the Lord cannot sleep because if the Lord sleeps, then the whole universe will collapse. That means one who is of the nature of pure consciousness has to be ever wakeful. And if we believe that our prayers are answered, then that Lord should not be caught napping. He should always be wakeful. So one of the qualities of the Lord especially those who believe in a formless God. They do not know how, but they believe that the Lord cannot sleep. He is ever wakeful, he is ever alert, he is ever conscious. So these are the few qualities which uh, explain the nature of God. Then the doctor tells him, isn't it a beautiful song? Particularly the line, where is his limit? Where is his end? The seekers forever ask. Now this idea of infinitude, being a scientist, it always fascinated uh, Dr. Sarkar. He loved those aspects of the song where 
perhaps he would not agree uh, in many uh, places where they think that God is graceful because his science told him that uh, why does so much sorrow? The typical scientific question is if their God is always graceful, gracious, then why do we see so much sorrow in the world? So perhaps he would have also asked this question. So he is not focusing on that aspect of the song, but he is focusing on that aspect where uh, he likes that line where he says, where is the limit, where is his end, because that satisfies the principles of science or the scientific approach to truth which he believed in. He believed that the infinite the infinite can never be comprehended by the mind. So he at least he accepted because that was a logical question that the limited mind which has a limited capacity has no capacity to comprehend the infinite. So he says where is the limit? Where is the line? Uh, where, is the, where is the end of God or where is the beginning? So this line somehow uh, appealed to his rational uh, attitude and he is praising that. M says, yes sir, it is indeed very beautiful. A beautiful conception of the infinite. Doctor affectionately, it is quite late. Have you eaten? I finish my meal by 10 o'clock and then go out to give consultations. I don't feel well if I go to work without eating. Listen, I have been thinking of inviting you all to a feast. Now, Dr. Sarkar was very much touched by the great devotion and the dedication with which all the disciples of Sri Ramakrishna were taking care of Thakur. So, he liked, he slowly started. First of all, he said he did not like the concept of devotion. He did not like the concept of avatara. Uh, and the concept of guru and all those things. But when he saw that whatever may be their belief, even if he did not believe in their belief, he knew that these people, M, Narendra and all the wonderful disciples were so compassionate, were so kind and so nice to Sri Ramakrishna, so dedicated in their service to him, that he was definitely his heart, got inspired and that is why he loved all these group of devotees though he did not believe in their philosophy so that's why he says i wish to feed you people all of you because he knew that most of the people would not eat properly because they were so much uh, keen to serve sri Ram krishna that they often forgot whether they had eaten or not so m used to take the first possible opportunity and not bother about his food and other things and go to uh, Dakshineshwar or afterwards to Shampakur or Kamar or Kashipur and spend a lot of time because they knew that Sri Ram Krishna is not going to live long and they wanted to him to live longer so that they could get his holy company more. So, M in knowing fully well that these people sacrificed a lot to serve Sri Ram Krishna, he says, I want to feed you. Then, then M says, yes, that would be fine. Doctor says, where, where should it be, here or there, whether I should feed all of you at Shampukur house or invite all of you to my house. M says, sir, whether it is here or there, everyone will enjoy it. Now the topic of conversation turns to Mother Kali. The doctor, <coughs> of course, like all the Brahmos, they never accepted the concept of Kali. They thought it is a primitive kind of worship which tribal people did, which evolved into mother worship and the Hindus have taken it. So they accepted some other incarnations or at least tolerated but the Brahmos were terribly against the idea of the terrible aspect of God which was depicted in Kali without understanding the true implications. The, 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 the true significance of that, they used to blindly criticize and say this is some primitive tribal worship which the, uh, the robbers and the decoits used to do and they used to worship this primitive god goddess Kali, so she is a tamasic goddess and one should not worship. 
So doctor suddenly made a very strange remark. He said, Kali is just a Santhal woman. M laughs loudly. M could not believe that such an educated person would speak in such. He said, this is a Santhal woman who later on was deified because the color texture of Kali was black. So they said somehow the a, a very uh, powerful Santhal woman was there. Santhals are normally dark skinned people. They are tribal people in that part of East India. So the Santhal Parganas and all those the, 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 these areas, they are full of tribals. So he says this, maybe she is one Santhal woman who has been deified as it happens in many cases. Many of the primitive worship primitive practices of worship were taken up and then it, they got evolved and got absorbed into our Puranas. So M says, sir, where did you hear that? Where did you get that? The doctor says, I heard something like that somewhere. And then they will all laugh. Because they were not serious at all about worshipping goddess. But in spite of that, they did not mind if Sri Krishna, at least the doctor did not mind that Sri Ramakrishna worship Mother Kali. Because he says, after worshipping Mother Kali, if one can have such a wonderful nature, such a pure nature, such an innocent nature, such a wonderful life, full of spiritual ecstasy, joy, and the capacity to transcend the body, then it should be something very great. But they still did not approve of worshipping Mother Kali, uh, especially in the image. So the doctor said, <clears throat> the previous day Vijay Krishna and some other devotees had experienced ecstasy. The doctor was present. The conversation turns to it. The previous conversation, if you see the last gospel class, we discussed about this ecstasy which uh, the devotees felt. And M was, uh, and uh, Madhiralal Sarkar, Dr. Sarkar was a witness to that. He said, how could normal people be full of emotion, divine emotion, at the mere singing of song by Narendra, Narendra perhaps was singing and Sri Krishna was uh, adding a few lines to that song and he went into Samadhi. Seeing all the people, all of a sudden, raised to a level of spiritual ecstasy, M was, uh, Dr. Sarkar was surprised. <coughs> so he is discussing that. Doctor says, I saw it, but it is, but is it good to have so much of emotion? Somehow he felt he was the one who was just watching it and he thought it is perhaps excess emotion which these people are, it's a show of emotion which these people are exhibiting, the devotees, including Vijay Krishna Goswami who himself was a Brahmo. Even he went into ecstasy and started jumping, dancing and all. M says, Paramahamsa Deva says that an excess of ecstasy that comes by meditation on God does not harm you even if it is very deep. So he says, Sri Krishna makes a clear distinction between the ecstasy or the type of spiritual emotion that you develop when you go into ecstasy, when you meditate on deep spiritual truths. The kind of ecstasy or joy or bliss you experience is not the kind of emotional joy or bliss you experience when you enjoy the worldly objects. So there is a huge gulf, huge difference. This emotion can be harmful, but that spiritual emotion can never be harmful. So he says, he says the light of a gem soothes the body, does not burn it. Emotion, if it is compared to a fire, which gives light, uh, which gives definitely gives light, but it burns as well. Whereas Sri Ramakrishna, just to compare the effect of spiritual ecstasy or spiritual emotion and ordinary emotion. Ordinary emotion burns you. If it is grief or even if it is some kind of worldly joy, ultimately in the longer run, those emotions are harmful for our physiological, for our body. Whereas the spiritual emotions, according to Sri Ramakrishna and according to M is quoting Sri Ramakrishna, he says they are like the gem. The gem gives light but it does not burn it is very cooling that light is very cooling whereas the fire light, light of fire it may be bright but at the same time it has properties which will burn you so the difference between the light of a gem and the light of a lamp or a coal 
which is burning. Uh, one burns, the other doesn't burn. So that is how Sri Ramakrishna used to explain that spiritual ecstasy or emotion will not uh, harm anybody. So, but the doctor is very intelligent. He says, but the lust, luster of a gem is only reflected light. It doesn't have an original light. The light of uh, fire is original, whereas the gem can only reflect. If it is in the dark, it will not reflect in any light. Unless the light falls on it, it will not reflect. So M says, yes, he also says by drowning in the sea of him. So he gives another example. Because if you take these examples, similes or these things literally, it is difficult to uh, understand the true import of what Sri Ramakrishna is saying. So he says, Sri Ramakrishna gives another example. He says, by drowning in the sea of immortality, one does not die. God is the lake of immortality. Diving into it does no harm. In fact, he becomes immortal, provided he has faith in God. Now, this was one more example which he gave Narendra Nath. Once Sri Ramakrishna asked Narendra Nath, if there is a soul, bowl of, a bowl full to the brink with the nectar of immortality and you are just a fly, what will you do? So Narendra said, I will sit on the rim and sip, uh, uh, sip that nectar and become immortal myself. Then Sri Ramakrishna said, why will you not dive into it if there is a nectar of immortality? Narin said, no, 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 I will drown. So that is how we misinterpret these things. Then Sri Ramakrishna corrects him and says, how will you drown? That is the nectar of immortality. It is not a gross nectar. It is not a gross syrup where if a fly falls, it will... So we can't compare the gross with the subtle truths. They are just used as examples or similes or as... Uh, comparisons, but one should not take it literally. That's why M says. Doctor says, yes, of course, he said that, he said that. Doctor Sarkar gets into his carriage. After examining three or four patients, he will go to see the Paramahansa Deva. On the way, he talks about M, about different things, beginning with Mahima Chakravarti egotism. Mahima Chakravarti was a uh, person full of ego, though he was a very great scholar. He is a nice person, but whenever he came to meet Sri Ramakrishna, used to argue a lot. And Sri Ramakrishna, though he very patiently corrected him, he knew that purely intellectual understand, pure intellectual understanding of a spiritual concept will not give the necessary experience which is valid. So one has to transcend the um, role. Though intellect is necessary, as Swamiji said, we have to use reason. Reason is just a street cleaner. But the moment you transcend reason and get the experience of spirituality, the spiritual experience has come to you uh, through intuition and through a faculty higher than intuition. When you get into that state, they are far superior. And that experience was what Sri Ramakrishna was speaking. But, and that is why he used to criticize Maimacharan Chakravarti, uh, who used to, Maimacharan used to come and uh, sometimes when something was being discussed, he used to quote from scriptures because he was very well read and he had no other job to do but to read these books. So being a Pandit, he would be reading a lot of books and whatever little he read, he thought he was wise and he could quote from those scriptures without understanding the true import. So, M is trying to discuss his egotism because he had also observed sometimes when Sri Ramakrishna was telling something, some wonderful experiences he had, Mahima Charan would sometimes interrupt and ask all sorts of intellectual questions. M says, yes, he visits Ramakrishna, Sri Ramakrishna, even if he has a little ego, it will fall off in a few days. A person's pride vanishes when he sits near him. When that means when Sri Ramakrishna, when he is in the company of Sri Ramakrishna, his love, the force of his wonderful spiritual experience will somehow remove that whatever little pride or pride of ego is there in him. Said so it's harmless because that's why uh, Sri Ramakrishna also tolerated him. He knew that it was because of ignorance that he is uh, swelled with the pride of ego. So he says it gets crushed sooner or later. Sri Ramakrishna sees to it that 
this ego does not hinder him from becoming really spiritual and it will get crushed sooner or later. The reason is that he has no egotism. No, pride takes flight before a very humble man. The reason why that happens is that Sri Krishna is totally bereft of ego. There is no ego at all. He is like a five-year-old child as in his own words. Pride takes flight before a very humble man. So, the force and power of spiritual experiences and the humility of a person has the capacity to humble the pride of anybody's ego, however powerful or however uh, strong he may believe in his ego. So he says the same thing happened in the case of Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar also. See what a great person Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar is. How much modesty and humility he showed in front of Thakur because he knew uh, Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar knew that all my learning and all the knowledge which I have, secular knowledge that I have is nothing compared to the wonderful wisdom which flows like a spontaneous fountain from this wonderful sadhaka of God. So he showed an utmost respect when Thakur went to visit him and Thakur in fact praised him. He said you are Vidyasagar, you are the ocean of knowledge. So but with Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar was equally humble. He said, I may be an ocean of knowledge, but it is all salty water. Meaning to say that you, you, are, you are a vast ocean which is not salty, but my knowledge is uh, very salty. Nobody can drink that water. What he meant was that spiritual knowledge is higher than the academic or secular knowledge that he had. So he had that humility and that shows that Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar was a man of uh, spiritual inclinations. That's why Thakur loved him deeply. The Paramahamsa Deva went to see him in the Badur Bagan house. It was 9 in the evening when he said goodbye. Vidyasagar himself carried a light to show the way from the library to the carriage. And he stood there with folded hands till the carriage left. That was the kind of reverence and respect he gave Sri Ram Krishna. Though he was not even... He did not even go to school. But Vidyasagar knew the limitations of uh, academic knowledge. So that's why he used to stay, stand with folded hands. Uh, whenever Sri Krishna came and whenever he went away, he used to show utmost courtesy and respect which was due to a person who was spiritually far, far superior than him. The doctor says, well, what does Vidyasagar think of him? Because everybody respected Vidyasagar. So the doctor was also a very academic person. So he's asking, what did Vidyasagar say about Sri Ramakrishna then? No doubt he was humble and he was very kind to him. But what was his opinion? The M says he showed him great respect that day. But I think from what he said afterwards, he doesn't like what the Vaishnavas call ecstasy. His views are like yours. So finally he says, though he showed him respect, somehow he did not like the singing, dancing and he thought it is just an emotion. One should rather do charitable work than sing and dance and all those things. So perhaps he holds similar views as yours. When you say that emotions are not good, maybe he also holds the same views. Doctor says, I don't like folding hands or touching somebody's feet with my head. There is no difference between head and the foot. But if you consider feet different, then go ahead and do it. So M is trying to, uh, the uh, Dr. Sarkar is trying to logically explain. And he says he doesn't believe in all these superstitious, uh, so-called superstitious beliefs like doing pranams and bending one's head before others and all those things. He says, but if you, but he, at the same time, he doesn't criticize them. He says, okay, if you feel they are different, so you do it. So for him, he says, the all the parts of the body, whether you uh, bow your head or shake your hands, it should be the same for him. He was a person, a very rational person. M says, <coughs> you don't like the ecstasy or anything like that. The Paramahansa sometimes calls you a deep soul. Perhaps you remember yesterday he told you that an elephant goes into a small pond makes a big splash, but when it goes into a lake, there is hardly any movement in the water. Whereas the elephant of emotion, when the elephant of emotion enters into a deep soul, 
it can't affect him in any way. He says that you are a deep soul. Now, Sri Ramakrishna could know the inner nature of M, though he apparently to all external circumstances, external appearances, he was a dry soul, he did not have emotion. So also Narendra Nath, he never went into ecstasy when the songs were sung. So he was thinking uh, that what is the reason and Sri Ramakrishna in the previous class he explained the reason that you see your capacity is so huge that you are like a lake. You are not easily uh, emotional, do not become easily uh, emotional by nature or go into ecstasy. It takes a lot of spiritual depth or spiritual thinking to uh, incite uh, those emotions in you to uh, make you go into ecstasy because you are like that huge lake and comparing the elephants with the emotions. The elephants, if they come in a big lake, there is hardly any ripple. The lake is able to absorb everything. Whereas if the elephant goes to a small pond, so depending on the capacity of a person, according to Sri Ramakrishna, it is the capacity of the person that is important. A person who has a higher spiritual capacity will not get emotional at smaller things. He needs a very high experience to become emotional. So also he consoled Narendra. He said, don't worry because you don't get these experiences. They may not come to you because you are far more deeper than these people who apparently have this, uh, who ex exhibit these ecstasies because they are like small ponds. A little bit of uh, spiritual experience will make them ecstatic and emotional. Whereas you... It will take a much bigger because you are already had all these experiences. So they are no longer, uh, they no longer affect you the way it affects the ponds. The lake is so big that even if an elephant goes, the water will not be disturbed. So we will, uh, now after that he will be going to, uh, I'll close now. We almost have completed. <clears throat> but the doctor is very humble. He says, I don't deserve the compliment. After all, what is ecstasy? It is a feeling. And then there are other feelings too. If love for God and other feelings are deep, some can control them, others cannot. So we will discuss this. This topic is being discussed because M was very much surprised uh, to see so many people becoming ecstatic at the songs that were being sung. So he was very much influenced. Uh, by that, but he wanted to know the reason why these experiences come to a devotee. So the ideas of difference between emotion and ecstasy, why these experiences happen, what is the test of spirituality, all these things we'll discuss in the next class. If there are some questions you can ask. We'll close for today. Maharaj, Maharaj, this is Vasudev Pandya from Los Angeles. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Maharaj, I have a, uh, I need your blessing. I received a email for Council of Parliament of World Religion. Okay. And in February, okay. first week of February, they are going to celebrate interfaith harmony. Okay. For one week. Okay. Uh -huh. This is interfaith okay. harmony week. <laughs> Where is that? That's in uh, the Council of Parliament of World Religion in Chicago. Yeah. They joined with yeah. the United Nations and they are going to celebrate one week of interfaith harmony. In New York? In, uh, in New York, yeah. One interfaith harmony. It's, they call it interfaith harmony. I know, week. I know. I know that organization. But where will they do so, it? No, this, this will be celebrated uh, by different... Uh, Agencies connected with them, they will do it. Oh. But I, it reminds oh. me, mm. if you have gospel in it, page eight hundred and seventeen, Suren Nath Babu went uh, draw, have a painting done, yes. in which the Ram Krishna is showing to Keshav Chandra Sen. In that painting, yes, there is a church, yes. there is a mosque, and there is a temple. It's all are worshiping the same God. Yes, He's telling Keshav Chandra Sen. Yes. yes, it's on page eight hundred and seventeen. Yes, yes. And then Sri Thakur said in the gospel, it said, it's the ideal of modern times. Mm. Thakur is telling Keshav Chandra, this is the ideal of 
yes. modern times. Yes, I remember that painting is. He had his painting made. Yes, yes. It's very good. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, but uh, with all the COVID and other things, they're, they're holding it online. No, the, 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 the diff different organizations. But this is a painting. I don't know if I you can see it. Yeah, yeah. So I have seen that painting. It's a very nice painting. It's there. But no, what I mean to say, this organization, which the uh, I mean, this Parliament of Religions, are they doing it online? All the functions? No, this, I, I'll, I'll find out and send a an, uh, WhatsApp to you. I'll oh. find out and send a an WhatsApp to you. Okay. But but so Swami Vivekanan commented on Sri Thakur that no one in the world has become a Christian and a Muslim being a Hindu. No one in the world has become a Christian and a Hindu in turns. Yes, yes. Thakur is yes. the only one who became a Christian and a Christian and a Muslim in turns. Yeah, he is unique. His stage of spiritual harmony transcends all the other experiments made. Others are all uh, um, uh, they try to express harmony in an intellectual way, but here it transcends that, and it's the experience which he shared with everybody that really matters. Anyway, it is yes. nice to know about this. Thank you. Yeah, well, keep on deep, deep. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, Mara. Okay, Namaste. So. Namaste, Maharaj. Yes, Thank Namaste. So, I'll take your leave now. Om Shanti 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 Hari Hi Om Tat Sat. Sri Ramakrishna Arpanamastu Namaste Thank you, thank you, Namaste Swamiji Thank you Namaste Pranam Maharaj Pranam